And we are live. Welcome, folks, to episode 3,467 of the Survival Podcast. Today's episode is called Getting the Gardening Edge in 2024. And by the edge, I'm not talking about the permaculture edge where all the abundance is. I'm talking about an edge, like an edge on the competition. All the things that I've been doing over the years, uh, and specifically with my primary garden over the last four years, that involve things like bioactive compost, cover crops, uh, specific soil amendments and things like that that have this year before the main crops even start growing. I already know this will be the best year that I've ever had. How can you know such a thing? What? How could you possibly know in the spring when you're planting that you're going to have one of your best years ever for production? It doesn't really seem to make any sense unless over the years you've developed an eye and a nose, and you know what to look for. This weekend, I put in over 200 starts, 200 transplants. I'm going to talk about how I did that and what I observed in doing that. But I will tell you that this episode today on this Monday is from two things. One is my experience this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, planting all these plants and just being excited. And I like to talk about things that I'm excited about. The other, though, is from a question, a question that came in for a, from a listener that was seemingly unrelated, but I think is 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 highly related, uh, highly related, and uh, will make a lot of sense uh, as we uh, go through today's uh, episode. I need to answer a text here real quick. Anyway, sometimes things do come up that need immediate uh, responses. So sorry for that delay there. Before we uh, get into this subject, let's go ahead and hear from our two sponsors of the day. Sponsor of the day, number one today, is usaberkeyfilters.com. That, of course, is Jeff the Berkey Guy Gleason. Jeff was one of the first sponsors we ever signed. I think Jeff first joined us in 2010, very early in the year. Uh, there was a couple of years that he wasn't a sponsor. He's come back around in the past few months, and we've brought him back happily as a sponsor. He's maintained his status as an MSB discount vendor since 2010. So that's 14 years he's been supporting us one way or another. And here's the thing. You need to make sure you're drinking the safest and best water possible. For that, you need a filtration system. It makes a lot of sense, in my, my opinion, to get a system that really can't fail, that has no moving parts, uh, and it is the least expensive to operate long term. Berkey fills all of those roles. Check them out at usaberkeyfilters.com. And, you know, get your Berkey from the Berkey guy, not from some guy that just discovered Berkey and started, you know, uh, selling them at gun shows last week or something. Get somebody that's going to give you the support uh, that you've come to expect from sponsors of the Survival Podcast. Jeff is one of the top resellers for Berkey in the country. And due to that, when there is an issue, he has no trouble getting it resolved. Again, usaberkeyfilters.com. Next up today, the Exit and Build Land Summit 4 is coming up. If you'd like to come meet me in person and learn from some tremendously intelligent folks, Joel Salatin, Nicole Sauce will be there, all kinds of really awesome people. There'll be even be a virtual presentation uh, by the co-founder of Permaculture himself, David Holgram. Uh, and it is just the whole experience is amazing. Let me be honest about me and public events, especially in the spring. First of all, I turn down 90 percent of all of them that I'm invited to. I just don't have the time for tra travel. That's that's number one. Number two, I turn down everything in the spring except exit and build. And there's a reason. One. OK, there's two reasons. One is it is a three hour drive. Right, for me. So I, I can logistically do it. But really, it's because John does such an amazing job. The events, the, 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 the networking, all of it. It's at a fantastic event venue, the Bastrop Community Center. Uh, it's, it's just a great experience. John just does events well. And if I'm going to be at an event, I want one that's done well. Some of the people I've met there have been really helpful to me long term. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you this, any event, not just this one, but if you go to an event, spend as much time meeting people as you do talking to speakers and listening to presentations. The value of building networks is huge. 
And there is a real community forming around the Bastrop area of Texas, a community that even if you're not going to live there, would be great for you to plug into. This is a good way to do that. And it will just be a blast. And you'll get to meet me and hang out with me and a bunch of other cool people. So do consider coming because I guarantee you, you won't uh, you won't resent it. And definitely consider upgrading your ticket to like one of the VIP tickets or something like that. The the meal alone is probably worth the cost of the ticket between the food, which is awesome. The experience was just awesome. And the people that you meet uh, that you can meet at a different level when you have that smaller group than the about 500 uh, that will be in the audience at uh, the main presentation. So anyway, let's get into this. Um, when I started planning this weekend, as, as intimately familiar with my soils as I am, I, I wasn't really prepared for like this sea change that, that's happened. And I think part of it is that last summer, last not this recent summer, the summer prior, was incredibly brutal. Things got overwhelming here. And I ended up just basically tarping three of the beds. And then through winter that year, I tarped three of the beds. I put down, I you know, did what I recommend. It, it was fine. And I had a great year last year. But this year, I took the full all-in approach. I got caught up on some of the things that had changed that for me. And I was able to do a multi-species cover crop going into the winter. And I was able to really manage that cover crop well. I was able to harrow with some of the best bioreactor compost I've ever made, having protect, you know, perfected that method. And that is a, a full year out from beginning to being able to utilize it. It was also the first year that I had used biochar heavily, even though it wasn't heavily in the compost yet. It was some in the compost, but it was all in the starts and the transplants. And that all went in. And this year, when I started planting, I felt like I was planting in somebody else's garden. When I would pull, so let me kind of give you what I did. I terminated all the cover crops. There's a video on that more later, uh, and I'll talk about how. And then I over mulched the cover crop, which became mulch. I over mulched with aged wood chips out of my, my stash over in my field. And I gave it about a week after doing that before planting. And when I pulled back the wood chips and then I had to pull back the cover crop mulch and then I put my hand into that soil, I realized something right away. I took my garden trowel and I hung it back up and I don't know if I ever need it again in that garden, in that whole four bed system. It was easier to stick my hand in the soil and pull the dirt out than to try to get a, 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 a trowel into the soil and get the dirt out. Because one of the things you got going on when you use cover crops is you've got all that organic matter that's in there, you're trying to pull apart some stray parts of it. And you've also got roots that are still decomposing and feeding the soil. And so you put a trowel in and you go to pull the dirt out and we've all done it. You're digging a hole and a root just takes the dirt off the freaking trowel. So after planting like the first two tomato plants, I just started reaching my hand in and grabbing soil. And I've had beds get like this before, but not to this level. The smell, the richness, the amount of what we would call macro arthropods. So macro is big, right? Well, all it means is not micro. It means you can see them with the naked eye. Arthropods, just about everything with an exoskeleton. Number uh, one organism in the uh, on the planet by total population. An ant is an arthropod. A springtail, a pill bug, any insect, any bug, all of them are arthropods. And like there was just so much going on so like you'd pull it back and you know worms pill bugs all types of decomposers little things popping around in there those are uh, what are called springtails and just seeing that amount of life in what you call the detritus sphere so everything that's dead that's laying on top of your soil gardeners call it mulch is your detritus sphere and then you have and I'm, I'm building all this into the cover crop course that I'm working on right now. Uh, in You have multiple spheres of the soil, the agratosphere, the porosphere, the drillosphere, et cetera. Like all of that was incredibly evident. And there, I want to say there wasn't a single hole. There may have been one or two. But almost every time I put my hands into the dirt and pulled just randomly, like I want to plant in that spot, pulled it out, there were worms in my hand. There were worms when I pulled it back. There were worms in the soil. There were worms 
everywhere. Now, some of you have been paying attention to me for a while, and you know that's a big deal because when I moved into this property, we would get excited if we found one worm. There were no worms on the property. The property was completely denuded of life, and it was dying. And that was 11 years ago. These beds are about four years old, and they have come so far in four years because the soil I had to fill them with that I could find a local supplier that would get it to me was crap. It had no guts to it. It had no, it was it was supposed to be a mix of compost and topsoil. It was it, it it felt more like sand than dirt. And we have taken that and and it was just absolutely inside exciting. The impact of biochar alone is only just beginning in that soil, and I, I think that'll continue to grow. And I'll talk a little bit about how I incorporate it into what we're doing this year and how it was part of the compost that we laid down in a bit. But we're just beginning to actually see the results of that. I saw that last year um, with as we led up to the fall workshop, we got one of our early freezes in. Usually we do not get a freeze before the fall workshop, especially we moved it up a week this year. So our first good freeze is usually right about Thanksgiving. It's usually just before or just after Thanksgiving in my climate. We got temperatures into the high 20s. And I mean, like, you know, going below freezing at midnight and not coming above freezing until 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. So long duration, not frost, but freeze. About half my uh, peppers and eggplants survive temperatures down to 28 degrees. Now, I'm learning more things about survivability with going outside of temperature zones and including inside temperature, why sometimes things don't survive. But the, the, the beautiful, the beautiful component to that was the only real variable that year was the biochar. I, I'm pretty convinced biochar is what gave those plants that added ability to, uh, to hang on. Uh, and, uh, Builder says sandy sandy dirt sounds like you got good stuff. Yeah, it, if it was sand, it would be good stuff. If it wasn't sand, then it was like sand. That that's not good. That's gutless, is what we call that. Uh, anyway, um, I want to talk about how I'm doing the transplants this year. So I made a mix. So I just had a you know like a two gallon bucket with me that came along for the ride as I was doing all these plantings, and every hole I would throw a handful of this mix in. I put the plant in. I'd inoculate with mycorrhizal, which I'll get to in a second. I'd throw another handful of the mix in, and then I'd back cover the hole. And the way I was doing that, and this is a great way to do things, by the way, when you're when you're planning. I would take a small cup, the little red Solo cup, and as I would take the dirt out of the hole, just set the cup on, you know, and, and put it, fill the cup up, and set it next to the hole. So when you're back filling your hole. You can just hold your little plant up and sprinkle that dirt around there. But the mix that I made was a mix of Dr. Earth fertilizer, kelp meal, biochar, and my compost. And I would say, you know, I filled that two-gallon bucket about three-quarters of the way up with just pure compost out of one of my compost piles. And then I used, I don't know, two cups of Dr. Earth and two cups of biochar thrown in there. It, it wasn't like I was really measuring. I'm trying to give you an idea. Like I don't get this wanky over it and get all, you know, in a wad over it and about two cups of kelp meal. And I took that bucket and dumped it in a five gallon bucket and dumped it back and forth a couple of times to get a good mix with it. And that was the mix that I was adding to the holes. Um, and as I was saying, every transplant also got a dusting of mycorrhizal fungi and um, but let, let's real quick, I want to talk about the Dr. Earth thing first. And I really think this is a, this is the best organic fertilizer that I've found because of the biology that's included with, there is just a, a laundry list of beneficial bacteria and, a, and a, a significant amount of beneficial soil fungi that are in the Dr. Earth product. It's also a low NPK the specific one that I recommend, which is the 444 Premium Gold. You do not want to be blasting your plants with super high amounts of nitrogen, even if it's a organic source of it. You get up over about 10 parts nitrogen, things start to happen that I can't get into today to your soil food web that you do not want to happen. It's not just that it can burn plant roots. It, it can literally cause soil organisms to like 
dehydrate or explode, depending on which osmotic action they get based on it. So this stuff just seems to be the best thing I could find. I do have links to everything in the show notes today. There's a link if you're watching the video in the video notes below where you can get over to that. Everybody else can just look up episode 3467. And I have a link to the Dr. Earth product where I've got it reviewed. I just want to remind you that Dr. Earth is one of our direct uh, supporting vendors for MSB. And depending on how much you're buying and what you're buying, it may be less expensive to go direct and get the discount, or it may be less expensive to buy on Amazon. Again, depending on how much you want and what have you, but the direct discount is 10%. So check that out when you're making your decision uh, about what to buy. But um, the Dino Myco is, is, is the other thing, which is the uh, mycorrhizal inoculum that I've been using. And I keep saying this, but there's a reason. The number one thing that you can do, in my opinion, to improve your results in your garden, if you're doing things at least organically, you know, and hopefully full scale regen ag permaculture. But if you're not, if you're not destroying things with, you know, synthetic fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides that might have a detrimental effect on your soil fungi, and you shouldn't be, then this will be the single biggest thing that you can do. And what I literally did, again, every hole got a handful of that mix I already told you about. And as I would get that plant ready to put in there, the and I'll talk about this in a second, that bench from Vivor, most back-saving, most comfortable, best accessory I have found for my garden in a long time. More on that in a bit. But a little pocket on the bench, I just reach down and grab a pinch of this fung, uh, fungal inoculum and right on the roots, even though some was put into the container at start, just a little dusting and into the soil. And I'll talk more about this later, but a lot of what I planted this weekend was not productive in the way that we think of it. And what I mean by that is there was there is no product that's going to come out of it that will actually be something I will eat or put on the table or sell. So non-cash crop, we would call those covers or interplants. I absolutely applied this mycorrhizal fungi to those plants as well. And those are things like zinnias and cosmos and marigolds and stuff like that, right? And you might wonder why. And this is part of why this is part of why I did today's episode. I got a question on Friday and it was a really intelligent question. And it was that this person talked to someone who runs a market garden farm. And they said you know, they were talking about me and my show and, you know, this person mentioned how fond I am of mycorrhizal uh, fungi. And they said, well, that's good advice. And your peppers, your tomatoes, et cetera. Yeah, you should definitely do that. But their point was there's no real reason to do it with short term plants like lettuces and greens and stuff. And this market gardener friend of theirs, that's like their number one uh, cash crop. And it, it generally is for market gardeners. You can turn greens quick. And then what they said is the, the 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 plant is not in the soil long enough for it to really benefit the way that a larger plant like a pepper or a tomato would. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's talk about something else then, though. This is not like throwing fertilizer in a hole. This is a life form. And it needs roots to associate with to propagate itself. So what's going in that spot next to your high turn crop? How many spores will be released into the soil for the future because we inoculate every plant that goes in? That doesn't mean we'll do it forever, but as we're still establishing and building up our gardens. And then my other thing with that is, again, that pouch can seem expensive if you read the, uh, the instructions on the pouch, but it's made, let's be honest, most of the high end inoculums and things like that today are made for the cannabis industry. Adding 50 cents to the cost of a plant in the cannabis industry is not even a rounding error. Like the value of one plant producing 10% better so exceeds that dollar that we don't even think about it. We do not need that amount. When I say a dusting, I mean a small pinch, like I'm putting salt or pepper on my food and right on the roots. Now, what you're doing is every plant that goes in, you're forming that association. You're going to improve the results of that plant, but you're upping the population in your soil. You're using a life form, not an innate thing, something that's, you know, dead or like it's not just organic matter. You're actually adding life into the soil, right? 
And yeah, Andy's saying it says a spoonful. I just use it again. I, same thing. Now, let me say if I was um, propagating long term perennials, let's say gojis or something like that, and I was and I was you know rooting them, then potting them up and then putting them out. When I potted them up, I probably would use a full spoon for a perennial, right? For annual gardening and how many plants we're putting in, that dusting is all that you need. That's all that you need. And I use like two or three pinches for your longer uh, crops, especially tomatoes. Tomatoes really benefit from this. Uh, but I, I just encourage you to consider at least adding that to what you're doing. And if you have any doubts, trial it. You know, take, if you do 12 tomato plants a year, inoculate six of them and don't inoculate the other six and just watch what happens. It, it will convince you so quickly because that, that fungal relationship is so beneficial in so many ways that I really can't get into uh, today. Uh, I also, I mentioned I terminated the winter cover crop and I have a video uh, that you might want to check out if you haven't already that shows different methods of termination. But in that video, I give away how to make a, what I call a termination board or a crimping board. And every time I bring this up, people are like, that's what they use to make crop circles. Yes, yeah, sort of. Um, People that make crop circles, though, they're like using, they're doing it with corn that's already dead and whatever. So they just use a board. Uh, the, the, the thing you do to make a crimping board is you take a single piece of angle iron and you bolt it to a two by four. And I would make that two by four the width of your bed up to the point if your bed is more than, I would say, four to five feet, then make it so that two passes will cover the width. Because when you have a board that if you had like an eight foot board, it, first of all, it's unwieldy if you had like an eight foot bed to be moving this eight foot two by four. But the other thing you're doing is that piece of angle iron is not sharp. It's dull. And when you step on it, what it's actually doing is it's crimping the, uh, the, the stock of the plant that you're trying to terminate. You don't want to cut it, especially grasses. What happens when you cut a grass? It, 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 it grows back. And there are some questions coming in. And those that look like Andy's question here, I can't even read it right now because I'm rolling, but I will probably see it and I will probably start. So that's how to do it. Anyway, um, you don't want to cut through, but you do want to significantly cripple the plant so that it can't transport nutrient to the top and that will cause it to die back. And especially a grass, if you cut a grass, like we mow the grass, what happens? It grows back. Doesn't matter. It's an annual grass. If it's not near the end of its reproductive cycle, you cut it. It's like you mowed it. It grew, grew back. So with grasses, we really, if they can have a little bit of a seed head in the milk stage, that's the one they're most vulnerable. So, but you go ahead and you crimp them. And what I ended up doing was I crimped everything. And then I went back with a, a weed flamer and hit it with a weed flamer. And I was playing with a bunch of different uh, episodes or uh, different methods to see. But what I've determined this year, the, the best policy, I think, for most gardeners is to make a crimping board, go straight on and crimp, then hit it with that flame torch and then mulch over top of it. That's what worked best for me this year. So even though that'll be part of my course, I'm going to give that away. Uh, and with weed flaming, and I say this in the video, but it's really important to understand we do not need, when we're doing weed flaming, to knock back a cover crop or weeds. We do not need to incinerate anything. We don't need to set anything on fire. The best time to do weed flaming, things are a little bit damp, and what you're flaming is green. And if you think about when you take something like, let's say, a handful of arugula or spinach, and you're going to make a side dish to go with your steak, you don't cook it down until there's nothing left of it. You throw it in the pan and you stir it around. When it turns bright green and it's wilted, you put it on your plate. That's what you want to do your weeds to your cover crop. When they get that bright green color, what's happened is the cells inside the plant, they swell up because they're full of water, and that intense heat causes it to form steam, and the cells go poop, and they rupture. And it is very, very effective if you combine the two together. And then if you have any other little pops up, you just take a little hand hoe or something and knock them down until your plants take over. You're disadvantaged. You don't have to kill everything. In fact, it's probably good that there's a little bit of cover crop life still going on. And you're disadvantaging your cover crop to the advantage of your production crop. And, and that's what we did. And it's, it seems to be working really, really well for us. 
and then mulching over a cover crop. This is why I do the courses, guys. The best information available on things like bioreactor compost, cover cropping, biochar, et cetera, the best information available right now is all being done at the agricultural level. It's being done in the regen agriculture market. It's being done for people that farm acres, not square feet. And there's nothing wrong with that, and I'm glad they're doing it. But the reason I bring that up is if I even have like a two-acre farm, right, two-acre vegetable farm, mixed vegetables, I'm not going to mulch two acres. It just isn't going to happen. And so you're not going to – the mulch will be laying down the cover crop, and that's the, the, the limitation you have. Imagine how much to put two to three inches of wood chips on two acres, how much that is. I don't know, but it's more than I have, and I have a lot. But we're not farming two acres. We're not farming 20 acres. We're not farming 2,000 or 200 or 2,500 or 10,000 acres. We can mulch in our gardens. Now, if you are farming, then, you know, you kind of take things to the next level of cover crop to leave enough of a mat. To make it work. And, and I will put some things about that in the course as well. But I'm building the courses for homesteaders, gardeners, people with market gardens and down, not people that are farming, you know, 20 acres. So if you can throw that layer of mulch on top of there and increase the detritosphere, everything gets better. And it also prevents a lot of the grow back. That's the it's actually not just an enhancement for the soil. It's not just a way to keep the soil armored and covered and keep the surface temperature down. It's also a way to, it's like an additional method of termination. Things don't grow as well when they have stuff packed up on top of them blocking the light. Um, next, some of the stuff that was evident when planning, I want to hit again, even though I, I mentioned it a little bit because it was exciting. Again, I found worms in almost every hole I dug. So, you know, you're sticking your hand in a hole, you pull the, the, the dirt clot out and you put it in the cup and there's a worm in there and you look in the hole and like a worm falls into the hole because he was going laterally through the soil and didn't notice you digging. Uh, when you have worms in your garden, you have fertility. You have an incredible bacterial aid. And one of the things we need to learn about worms is they are generally not eating what we think they are. So we put, you know, shredded leaves and wood chips and we grow cover crops and we got roots and we think those worms are like literally munching on that. They're eating more the broken down refuse of the lignin and things like that. And they're eating the microorganisms that are doing it. They're eating the waste products of the microorganisms that are doing it. Uh, they're eating the dead microorganisms that died after they ate it for a while, reproduced and gave up the ghost. And so your worms are actually gardening for you. I mentioned the soil spheres earlier. One of the soil spheres, like, like a hemisphere, right? Like, or the sphere that is the earth, you flat earth guys. I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to start yelling at me now. Go ahead. I'll ignore you because you're not worth talking to. Um, but the spheres of the soil, one is that, uh, that drillosphere from those worms. And that's just their burrows up and down, up and down. Well, as they're moving through there, they're carrying bacteria and ooze and uh, the, 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 the biogels on their body and they're depositing it. They're actually going to literally move fungal spores just like off their, their little, you know, their, the slime that comes off of them. They're also producing waste all through that drillosphere. But the other thing that they'll do, and I saw a video of this, and it kind of blew my mind. This this farm that is doing, you know, cover and no-till and always leaving, like it was a corn crop they had harvested. And instead of taking off the stover and, and selling it as silage or something, they just laid it to the ground as a cover and then replanted another cover into it for the winter. And this guy had video in the dark, so you could barely see it. And you see these huge brown leaves from the corn stalks moving and you could hear it moving and these earthworms that are like a foot long were coming up and grabbing that leaf pulling it into the soil and then kind of like quarter turn tucking it in and going back down in the soil they're the worms are gardening the worms are gardening they're making sure there's a full moist contact with that leaf and the soil 
so that the microbes and the other macro arthropods and micro arthropods will begin to feed on it so the worm can have what it wants. So when you get that cycle going, you've got a super bacterial mix going on for beneficial bacteria, but you're also going to get a great deal of fungal activity as well, which is great for dropping in all that mycorrhizal fungi. But I'm talking about multiple kinds of soil fungi that create these hyphae networks. There's even soil fungi. I don't think people realize this that will are, that act as predators. It's a fungus. You think how can a, a fungus be a predator? And yes, there are things like fungal infections. There are fungi that will literally infect the skin of a nematode. And while that nematode's crawling around doing his thing, it's spreading fungal spores until eventually the fungi overtakes it and kills it. So it, it's both growing, but there's active predation by some of the fungi in the soil. There are fungi in the soil that will generate a three cell strand, just three cells of fungi, and it forms like a loop. And when a nematode crawls through that loop, it will flood those cells with moisture. And when they do, they will swell up like 10 times their size, effectively closing the loop and basically lasso this moving nematode, which is actually quite quick at this scale, because it, that loop will close in a fraction of a second. So all of this life that is in our soil, when we start taking these approaches, we keep that life alive. And a lot of the things that we think of as problems tend to just go away, like pests and things like that. Um, the amount of leftover organic matter I found. I mean, I was finding roots and clods and just, like I said, you know, when you pulled the dirt out of the soil, you had to hold on to it so that all the stray organic matter didn't rake it back in the soil. And I, I'm just looking at this going, how is there so much organic matter? How is this soil so moist because we've had so much rain? But it doesn't clump. It doesn't clump. It's not like mud. It's it's beautiful. Like you take it in your hand when it's soaking wet and it still falls apart, but yet it agratosphere together at the same time. It, it's just beautiful. And I really encourage you to start on a process like this. Because what you're going to end up with, it might take several years, but you're going to end up with a garden that will literally grow anything. And, you know, you take a transplant that's already happened, you drop it in, it starts taking off in a day or two. That, that's what we're, we're trying to teach you guys how to build with these methods. Um, the macro arthropods, again, like centipedes, micro, you know, little bitty micro millipedes, uh, pill bugs, spiders. Uh, what I, I found, I, I learned a new species. It's called a Western yellow centipede. They grow a few inches long, but they're very, very thin. They don't get big like a normal centipede. I found those in my wood chips that I was putting in, so I'm sure they'll be there. They're a, an arthropod predator, right? And they're not something you need to worry about. They're not going to hurt you or anything. Like some, some centipedes can give pretty nasty bites. These guys apparently are pretty cool. And they're actually from Europe. And somehow they ended here and they're, they're endemic throughout most of the United States as well. There were just so many things. And these critters are what break down that residue is what it's called in cover cropping. So when you talk to conventional farmers, they'll say, well, I tried cover cropping. I couldn't plan or manage my fields because I had so much residue and it was there the whole season. It didn't go anywhere. What do you think about that? So farmer plants a cover crop, let's say cereal rye, just a single species cover crop. In his first season, he lays that cereal rye down. It's about three foot tall when you lay it down. Plants corn in, corn does just fine. But by the time the corn's done, the cereal rye looks like straw that's bone dry, sitting on top of the surface. Now you got corn stover, you're trying to do what that other fella did, and you're ending up with so much mulch that it's too much for the farmer. What does that tell us? Is there anybody in the live chat that can make the jump to what we know when lignans and carbons sit on the surface of a cultivated field that we keep as moist as we can under the circumstances and it doesn't break down? Something that should be there is missing. And 
I'll go ahead and just give you the answer. The answer is fungal activity. Fungal activity is what's missing. If you have good fungal uh, organisms in your soil and you take a carbon and you lay it and give it soil contact, that fungi is going to immediately start colonizing and breaking it down. Well, what aids in that, though, is all your little macro arthropods. And in one, one of Ray Acheleta's videos, he shows like they, they just take a soil sample from a conventional farm and they take one from one that's been managed properly and they just cut a big block out of it and they put it in a, a, a plexiglass box so you can see it. And they lay down a bunch of detritus on top of it and they put it in time-lapse photography. And you watch over 90 days that huge layer of refuse, that detritus, just break down and collapse. And on the other side, it just sits there. Now, they didn't add anything. All they did was just like been cut like a block of sod, you know, let's say two foot by two foot chunk and put it in a plexiglass box so it could be observed. When you watch the time lapse, it's not just the fungi. What you see are all these little critters, worms, springtails, pill bugs, all of them going up and down through that detritosphere, especially when the lights go out for the evening. And so the combination of the, the, the macro arthropod and the soil life and the worms, in addition to the fungi, is breaking down that residue. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't necessarily care in my garden because I just pull it back and plant. I'm not trying to drive a John Deere out there and plant, you know, a, a couple ton of soybean seed. I get it. But if you want the soil to really improve, then all of that detritus needs to be broken down and carried and channeled up and down through your soil for you. Now you don't need the rototiller anymore. Why do you need the roller tiller to get the organic matter into the soil when our little friends will come up and get it and take it down there for you? Better yet, they'll come up, they'll feed upon it, they'll go down in the soil and they'll poop it out. And when we combine this with deep taproot structures and, and hair root fibrous structures, et cetera, and Jesse's got it, it's tilling without tilling. You let nature till for you. Every one of us that's gone down this journey has at some point gone into a forest, gotten past that thick edge into the center of the forest, pulled the leaves back and looked at that soil and said, gee, I just wish I had soil like that. Well, how does that happen? That happens the same way we're talking about, as Jeff Lawton would tell you, the forest is the teacher. Bill Mollison said the forest is the ultimate teacher. And if we lose the teacher, we lose everything. Well, that's what's going on in the forest. You have all these life forms doing this and those trees grow beautifully and nobody irrigates it. And somehow they survive and they thrive and it grows this massive ecosystem. Well, if we stop killing it, then we will have that too. And if you're tilling, you're killing Tilling works. It works, short-term thinking. And it works because what happens is when you do push a massive amount of oxygen into the soil and right down as deep as the tiller works, you do. And below that, you create an anaerobic, you compact it. But in that fluffy zone, you create temporarily. Oxygen pours in there. What happens when we turn a compost pile? It gets really hot and shit breaks down fast. Why? We kick on the bacterial activity. Well, that's what we want. Not exactly this way. We kick on unfettered, non-competition, bacterial activity, specific groups of bacteria that like that situation. And what do they do? All bacteria are what are known as an R strategist reproducer. So we have reproducers like humans. We make one baby and it takes 18 years to become an adult. It takes 12 to 15, 16 years to become sexually uh, capable of reproduction, right? We generally frown on that that young, but you know when we were cave people, that probably was how things work. But it's a long term reproduction strategy. A, a primate has a uh, uh, that long term reproductive strategy, right? Uh, a, an elephant has a long term reproductive strategy. They take care of you know one or two or even you know, dogs are fairly long term. They might have a litter of eight pups, but they have to bring them up. And they go in a cycle of the next season. Bacteria, they just make and they start doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. If bacteria reproduced unfettered, 
it would take something like two months to double the mass of the planet. Right. So we're creating a micro version of that when we till. And so they go in and they eat all the organic matter and they reproduce as fast as they can in their population spikes. And then when they got nothing left to eat, they die. And we grow our food on their burnt bodies. That's what's left of them. And that's why we have to do it every year. Because we get that huge explosion and population collapse. And because we keep doing it, we, we continuously reduce the diversity of those species. It's a constant collapse of, of diversity until we only get a few that can function until we end up with compacted soils and less we till. And the same problem every year. And our return on the tillage goes down, 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 down. Tilling is killing. I don't say it because I'm an eco hippie. I don't say it because I'm a redneck hippie duck farmer, right? That's not why, okay? I say it because it's true. And I, I, I will acknowledge that it works because if we don't, then we don't reach the people we need to work because reach because they say, well, but when I do it, it works. Yeah, but it works for how long? And you have to keep doing it. And by June, when you go to dig a hole to plant in another plant, if you're gardening, you're like freaking digging at it with your trowel instead of just sticking your hand in there. So that's why we take this approach. Um, and again, digging was so easy. It just, it was so much easier to do by hand than with a trowel. And, and, and I've always developed my beds eventually to where you can do it with your hand. I've never done it to the point where I re really preferred it. It was just easier, especially like when things were coming out of like six packs or the small two inch pots. Like it was just one handful, drop it in, put it back. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. And yes, please, Richard is saying 69 watching. I have like 80, Richard. I don't know if that's multiple sources or what, but in any way, Richard's right. Please, if you're watching the video of this now or later when it's, you know, memorized, uh, please hit that like. It really helps us to reach more people. Thank you for reminding us of that, Richard. Um, now, I mentioned the mix that I made up, compost, kelp meal, uh, a biochar uh, going in, uh, into, uh, and Dr. Earth going into every hole. Tomatoes got one addition. Many of you have listened a long time, so you know exactly what I'm going to say it was, but it was aspirin tablets. James White out of California, to this day, I owe this man for turning me on to this trick. He's not the guy that came up with it originally, but he's the source that I heard it from. And what has happened is tomato blight no longer is the bane of my existence. Squash bugs. Actually, squash vine borers are still the bane of my existence. We'll see how that does this year. But 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 uh, there's just no tomato blight problem at all. I will get a little bit of blight on tomatoes, but they survive and they just grow through. I had tomatoes still being produced in November last year. And for a lot of you, like, so what? Big deal. I do that. That does not happen in North Central Texas. That does not happen in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Even all these other practices I've been doing, and I think if I keep doing them long enough, maybe I won't need aspirin anymore. But how much is a giant bottle of generic aspirin? I don't know, but I'm using the same one from three years ago. I put aspirin tablets in the cups with my tomatoes when I start them. I put three in the hole when I plant a tomato. And about once a month, I go to where my tomato plants are, and I poke a couple holes, a couple, three holes around them, and I pop in aspirin tablets like they are fertilizer pellets. And my blight problems are dead. I don't know that anybody really understands what's going on. I've read the research on it, and basically even the studies that have been done by like a and and stuff like that are just like, it works. It has something to do with the, with the salicylic acid or, or what have you, but no one really knows why. And aspirin, you know, you can make an analog to aspirin with white willow bark, and willow is a great root stimulator, and all, but that's not what it is. There is some buffering effect because my tomatoes have always had massive root systems. Um, but I, I highly encourage you, especially if you are still buying your plants instead of starting you on, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think most gardeners will be better off buying plants, especially certain plants, things that don't direct seed well in their first season or two while they're getting their gardens up to snuff and they're learning all the other skill sets. And then you add seed starting and seed saving to that 
because that's another skill set to learn. Right. So I, I get that. But if you are buying like Bonnie's or from your local, and I would definitely say if you're going to buy your plants, check feed stores, local smaller nurseries, things like that. Right now, <clears throat> I can buy if I needed them, let's say pepper plants, tomato plants, and some other stuff from a place called Russell Feeds, a buck 49 a plant. And they're well started. They're in about uh, three inch uh, seed starting pots. Uh, they're produced locally. Uh, they are not somebody's backyard because they have like nice printed plant labels and all on them. But it's definitely a local producer and a buck 49 a piece. At Home Depot, Lowe's, et al. Right now they are selling single tomato and pepper plants that aren't very big, by the way. You know, they, the, the, the thing's like a four inch round pot. But the plant itself is two, three inches tall. $5.99 for a freaking tomato plant. $5.99 for a single pepper plant. This is insanity. This is absolute insanity. It's just too expensive. So you're probably going to get better varieties and better pricing and better quality buying from someone like a feed store or something uh, than you will uh, buying from a box store. The box store stuff has gotten stupid. And I honestly think we need to get to a point of just refusing. Like gardeners in America just need to refuse to buy that shit until the price comes down to something reasonable. When they were three bucks, it was double the cost of getting them from a feed store or nursery. But the convenience man, it was like, eh, okay, and I don't need that many and, and what have you. Um, but six bucks for a tomato plant, you're not going to make your money back on it. And they're out there selling stupid shit. They're selling like two scraggly looking little uh, cucumbers that are you know an inch and a half tall for six bucks. Guys, just direct seed your cucumbers. Unless you're having cutworms or something, knock them out. Just direct seed your cucumbers and your beans. Don't, don't go buy freaking pre-started corn plants of, of all the stupidity. I saw that the last time I was there too. They had like they had like three stalks of silver queen corn in a cup for six dollars. You can buy six ears of silver queen corn for six dollars. This is just stupid. I mean, and, I mean, organic, high end, well produced, uh, high nutrient value silver queen corn. So be careful buying stuff like that. Um, anyway, but yeah, aspirin tablets in your, uh, tomatoes will change everything. The other thing is, and this is the second year using it, the, the PVC drip system has made everything just awesome. And I have a link to a video that shows how it works, but the, it has timers and what have you. And the beauty of this, when you're doing your transplants, you really want to water in well after your transplants. And so what most people do is they get a uh, like a uh, watering can or something and they water right at the plant and they water all the plants in. Well, you just take in this plant that's got a little bitty root ball because it came out of a pot and it has not yet extended its life web of roots into the surrounding soil. So it's really easy if the soil surrounding that plug is dry that osmosis will take the water out of that little root ball and move it out. That's why you put the plant in, you water it. It's not even that sunny out and it goes, and it just looks like screw life. I quit. I give up. And it does or doesn't come around after that transplant shock. But that's not the only reason you get transplant shock, but that's a big reason you get transplant shock. When you can finish that bed and turn it on and drench the whole bed in a slow soak, not only do you not osmotically pull the moisture out of the plant, you just think because everything becomes equalized and has enough, that plant is going to start sending those roots out to expand its reach much quicker. And so that was, this was the least transplant shock I'd ever seen. The other thing I did is I had looked at the, and if you can do this and you have the luxury of time, a great thing to do is look for a, a weekend, especially because then you have the whole weekend to work where you're going to have a lot of cloud cover. So you don't have intense sun, especially early in the season. It's because that plant has a day or two or three to kind of get its feet underneath it, literally, because its roots are its feet, before it gets hit with sun. Because even, you know, 70 degrees, we like 70 degrees. Intense sun at 70 degrees on a transplanted plant, a lot of times that plant will have a hard time. So hardening off is a good idea as well. But if you can... Time you're planting to overcast, misty, rainy. That's what this weekend was. 
that's a fantastic uh, way to go. Um, next, guys, the Vivor Garden Kneeler Bench. I I wish I would have found this thing a lot quicker. I wish I didn't have an ego, I guess. I've seen products like this before. I'm like, I don't need that. I'm not that old yet. And, you know, this season I was start, I was already looking for something. And it's not even so much up and down and up and down. What it is is that, you know, gardening season in the spring anyway is generally a pretty wet season. And so you kneel down and next thing you know, your, your, your knees are soaked through and you got mud all over your jeans and everything. And so I was thinking like what, you know, some of those knee pads that, you know, that like carpet layers use or just a mat that you can get on. And I had been using like some rolled up uh, weed blocker that was left over to do this with. So I saw this bench when I started working with Vivor. V-E-V-O-R.com. Remember, I have a direct relationship with them. You can get 5% off everything in the Vivor store. You can find everything that we uh, that you can buy from Vivor through tspaz.com. Support the show. But when I got set up with them, they have with what's called the Influencer Program, which is what I'm part of, where you can request samples. And when they first approached me, it sounded like I'd be able to request any sample I wanted. Uh, no, not so much. You click this little selector thing, and it'll show you like there's like six or seven things available at any given time. And most of the stuff is available right now. It doesn't fit well for this audience or for me. But this, I was like, yeah, I'll take one of those for free. They're like 35 bucks. So I requested when they sent it, I put it together. I did a video for you guys on it. I'm like, this is really impressive. And, you know, sitting on it, trying it as a kneeler, checking it out. I'm like, this is, I was impressed. Now that I used it for two days in a row to put in over 200 plants, I will never not have one. You need one. If you are especially raised bed gardening, you need one. My raised beds are about two feet high. I say in the video on it, you'll probably use it mostly kneeling. No, you won't. Sitting on it's perfect. You sit on it, and on one side, you do your first and your second row, and you build a four-foot raised bed, double reach, go around the other side, and you've got your other two feet of reach. But the freaking pouches. So I mentioned the mycorrhizal fungi. So it comes in a little zip-up kind of mylar bag. One of those pouches, I stuck it in there, left it open. It's not going to spill. It's not going to fall over. When you're ready, you reach down. Once you do it a couple of times, you don't even look anymore. You reach down, grab a pinch on the roots, and it goes. All my stuff, except the mix, the mix of the kelp meal, Dr. Earth compost and all, that was in a two-gallon bucket. So get up a little bit, shift it over, grab the bucket, shift it over, sit down, keep working. It was freaking fantastic. My back, by Sunday afternoon, without it, with that much planning, would have been crying. I would have crawled into a bottle of CBD oil. I was fine. I was fine. I was clean. I was, I, you know, I wasn't covered in dirt and mud and stuff like that. All I do is wash my hands. Get one of these. If you're using lower raised beds or in-ground beds, you'll probably flip it over and use the kneel function. The nice thing with the kneel function is the, the legs now become sort of like handles to help you stand up. Again, I'm just, I'm not ever not having one of these again. I made it today's item of the day. I really recommend you check these things out. I'm probably going to order the larger size one just for the hell of it uh, to get a better, uh, better feel on recommendation. But there's, again, there's a video on it. It folds up, it puts away you. <laughs> if you're a gardener and you don't have something like this, especially if you're doing higher raised beds, Really, and like the two-foot Vivor metal beds with this thing is like a garden starting kit, and your life will just be easy. All you have to do is figure out what to fill the beds up with, throw some irrigation on it, and start gardening, and start building this great soil. So we'll call that the item of the day for today, and uh, hopefully that'll be useful to some of you guys because I really I, – I just can't even begin to tell you how – fantastic using it was i came in saturday afternoon when i was probably really to quit for the afternoon and dorothy said i'm surprised you worked that long and i was like well it was a lot easier and i told her i'm pushing that bench again on monday because it worked so fantastically and it's damn comfortable too i'm surprised how comfortable it is i also wanted to let you guys know and this will be a big part of my course going much deeper into it that I planted a shitload of flowers, interplanted, right? And to me, that's a form of cover crop. 
What I consider cover crop is a plant that takes up a space that creates niches that is not planted for pure productive purposes. So if I plant a zinnia, I don't sell zinnias and what have you. I may take some seed from them and stuff like that. There's a value to that, but they're mainly there to cover a spot and to provide for pollinators and habitat and confusion. And what I planted was zinnias, cosmos, marigold, sweet alyssum, and safflower. And again, I inoculated them the same as I inoculated my peppers because I'm trying to build life in the soil. And uh, I probably have half of the plants that are in my garden this year are non-productive varieties. And I will probably get more production this year partially because of that than I have in previous years. So I really recommend that you start at least doing some interplanting of some uh, flowering species. And the ones I just recommended, I have a list of like 20 that are in the course. But these are all proven to have direct intrinsic benefits. Zinnia, Cosmos, Sweet Alyssum, and Safflower are all huge pollinator attractors. The Safflower variety I'm growing actually is sort of kind of a productive species because it's a safflower that was bred specifically to fill the same role uh, as saffron does. So saffron, of course, is from a crocus flower, and it's just the little pistils. Well, the the, uh, the petals of this particular variety of safflower are beautiful orange, and they color and flavor food very, very similar to the way saffron does, which is extremely expensive. The marigolds do some pollinator attraction, but pollinators generally don't seem to be extremely in love with marigolds. But marigolds have a lot of pest species that they repel, and they also have a pest species that they kill. And that pest species is one you will never see. Uh, a, a significant number of root, not nematodes, will be assassinated by marigolds. And it's similar to the story that I gave you about how the fungi do it. So the marigolds form these pretty big root systems, which are great. And a nematode comes along and goes, ooh, look, roots. And this is the kind of root. And it's, it, it seems to that nematode, like, this is a good root for me to go inside of and eat. And it goes inside that root, and that root just goes strangle. It just swells up the root fibers, and that marigold will eat the, the decomposing body of that nematode. Now, what a lot of people that are like, again, this is how I try to adapt it to gardeners versus farmers. What farmers will do is they'll grow a whole bed of, of, uh, of, of marigolds for a, you know, a season or half a season. They'll then terminate those marigolds, and then they'll plant a crop that traditionally has problems with nematodes in that bed, and then they'll keep doing rotations of that. Why not just set little traps all through your garden? It looks pretty. They're hardy as hell. They grow well. They repel other pests. And you're setting all these nematode assassins to work in your garden. So that was the reason for the uh, the, uh, the 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 marigolds. But I really recommend you put some stuff in. Sweet alyssum is this carpeting millions of little flowers, like so many tiny pollinators. So the ones that I gave you today, even though I have a much longer list coming, um, they're the ones that are easy to find, easy to grow, cheap, available everywhere. Even if you didn't start your own yet, you can probably buy. Zinnia Cosmos Marigold from Home Depot and Lowe's. And unlike what they charge for a tomato plant, you can get a flat of them for, you know, 10 bucks or something like that. So just something good to know. Still to plant. Um, I have not yet planted my serpent gourds for the year. Some of my squashes, though I don't know how much squash I'm going to do this year. I may give that a break. My Asian cucumbers, giant okra. Uh, I'm planting a, it's called a tree okra. Uh, this year in the side of my garden that gets the most intense sun exposure, primarily as a shade plant. Uh, plus, I'm interested to see what okra off of that particular uh, species is like. I also still have six garden beds that are in desperate need of this improvement. They started with the same soil. They have not been managed the way that these beds have. And this year, they are going to be summer cover crop, the majority of what's going to be done with them. And I'll give you some of the species I'll be using. Buckwheat, I'm going to be using buckwheat because it is a massive pollinator attractant. It's also incredibly quick growing. 
and incredibly quick to turnover, and you can do multiple crops of it in a single season. Cow pea, if you made me pick for summer, I could only have two cover crops for summer. It would be cow pea and buckwheat mixed together. I'm also going to be using sunflower, sun hemp, uh, sedan grass, more flowers. Uh, I'm going to be using a lot of things. And I will be, even though it's going to be part of the course, I will be sharing a lot of it. Remember, I don't secret away knowledge. So I will, st- you know, like, I-, I honestly believe you can learn almost everything you learn in my courses if you're willing to weed through years of, of, of what I've done. When I consolidate it, I, I kind of have to charge for it to put it together that way. To give you an idea on this cover crop course, I've been working on it for two months now. I am not done building the decks, the PowerPoint decks for it in too much. Every time I think I'm going to move on to the next section, I'm like, oh, I need to add a section for this. Um, it is literally like opening a can of worms and they just the worms start turning into like clowns out of the car, uh, clown car. I want to make sure I give a full understanding of it. Uh, but we'll be doing that. We'll also be using probably some millet in that. And I'll, I'll throw out a thing for you. Millet and um, buckwheat are an awesome way to do a rapid rotation in cover cropping a bed that you're not going to, you're not really going to grow anything in this summer, but you want to start really getting it because well, both will take about 45 days to maturity. And that means that, you know, in almost any client climate, you can do a buckwheat followed by millet or a millet followed by buckwheat and get two rotations in one summer. You can put in one, broadcast seed it and terminate one on top of the other and let it grow up and through. If you're going to do that, I would go millet first, buckwheat second. Uh, buckwheat will pretty much outcompete anything. And when you put your buckwheat in, you can interplant uh, cowpea. And you can get a three crop rotation like that with a single and then a double after it. So they're really useful. Now, what I'm going to do this year, and it's going to be interesting to see how it works in only four foot wide beds. I met a gentleman in Missouri a few years ago. He was only farming 18 acres of the farm he bought. This was the farm I've talked about before. It was so bad the way it had been managed until he bought it that when he went to the land office to do the title work after he bought the farm, he was literally mocked by the girl that did the paperwork for him. She told him he was going to go broke having bought that farm. In a 10-year cycle, He got the soil to be so good that when he sent it in to NRCS for analysis, the the guy that did the testing called him up and said, what are you doing? In the part of Missouri you're in, it is illegal, federally illegal to plow native prairie soils. The guy's like, it's not native prairie soil. They had never seen soil of that quality come in from a grower ever from that part of Missouri. What this guy was doing was, I think they were 12 foot strips. So it was two passes with a six foot machine, something like that. And he was doing eight different cover crops. And well, it wasn't really eight different cover crops. It was like four cover, like four or six cover crops and two productive crops. And then constantly rotating the strips is how he did this. And he was doing all his, all of his planting on contour. So all the strips followed contour. What I'm going to do is take these mixes of covers and kind of do them like in four paths in each uh, bed. Now, some of them you could terminate and replant in a single season. Some of them you can't. And some I might just let take over, but start them out that way. So I'll be sharing all that as I go, uh, kind of taking things to another level with this. So the big difference this year and, and how we got here, I think it's an accumulation of the cover crops and continuously doing cover cropping and feeding the soil and grading carbon cycling. I think one of the things people understand, if you want carbon in the soil, you need a plant to do that. You either have to go get an input over here and mix it in and tilling is killing, or you have the, the, the way to do this is a plant is a solar powered machine that among other things puts carbon in the soil and they cycle the carbon. And I think that one of the things we have to get our heads around in this space, the whole regen ag permaculture space, the total organic matter in the soil is an interesting indicator. And there are places where, you know, it's, it's obviously too low. The average conventional farm has less than half a percent. The soil is pretty much an inert growth medium. You're doing in-ground hydroponics in most of farming country. So that that's obviously too low. 
a, a good number to strive for as you're repairing to start, kind of turn the corner is considered about 2%. And we have farms that are 4 6 8% organic matter now. So since 8 or 6% is considered doable, the person that's only at 2 you're like, boy, you got a long way to go. Well, where are you? If you're in the sandy soils of California that are traditionally incredibly productive, you may never see your organic matter move up much above 2%. Now you might be like, well, that just means it's no, it's it's fine because what's happening is you're developing a rapid cycling of carbon. So you have a long growing season. Southern California, you grow 360 days a year. And you're constantly cycling new organic matter through the soil. That's fine. So we have to have the context. And that's something that I'm going to make sure it's in this next course is context. Because I know what everybody wants. When I when I polled the audience, what do you want in a cover? What mix do I plant? Oh, dear God. We'll have a whole chapter on how you make your own mix. Exactly how to figure out what you want to plant and where. Because context is everything. What are you planting? Where are you? When are you planting it? How are you going to irrigate it? Are you going to irrigate it? Are you going to terminate it? How are you going to terminate it? Are you going to nature terminate it with winter kill or summer kill? What are you going to plant after it? Mixed vegetables, that's a different answer than corn. So I know that's what everybody wants is just tell me what to do. And I will have some things like you can do these things and it's going to work. But when you really begin to understand cover cropping, you start to realize that different plants do different things well. And different plants respond to changes in temperature differently. If I plant winter pea here, I could literally do nothing and in another month. It won't be an issue for termination. The sun will come up and murder the peas, right? How long will they live in your climate? I don't know, right? If I plant something like annual ryegrass here and I roll crimp it, that's all I got to do because as soon as the heat comes, it's done. If you live in Virginia, especially in the, like the cooler, higher elevations, annual ryegrass can damn near seem to become a perennial ryegrass to you. And it might be a lot more difficult to deal with a fast-growing grass taking nitrogen like crazy out of your soil. So it might work for me, but not for you. Or you might have to be more specific about when you plant it and when you terminate it and how you terminate it than I do. You may absolutely need to, if you do an annual ryegrass and you roll or crimp board it, you might, like I flame kill because I have a flamer and it's easy and fast. You might have no luxury of choice. You might have to. It always changes based on context. And we need to start understanding that in the permaculture, regen ag space, a hell of a lot better because we have so many content creators and what they're telling you is true for them, but they're not giving you the context. And that leads to all kinds of problems. That leads to all you have to do is, and then it's like uh, like Brady Bunch, you know, everybody, all the other influencers start, oh, that one got a lot of views. And they all start saying the same shit. And then Bill takes this thing with no context, does it, and he's miserable. And he says, this doesn't work. Well, what was the, what, when did you do it? How did you do it? And how did you end it? Right. And that's so important with cover cropping. Uh, bioreactor compost. Guys, take the course. It's, I, I don't hard sell my own products very much. You know, I mentioned MSB once or twice a week real quick. Um, and it's how I pay my bills. I'm telling you this because there is nothing you can do to build soil life like bioreactor compost. And it's, it's a lot of work one day a year and it's cakewalk the rest of the year. And the course I put together tells you exactly how to do it. And one thing I'll be doing this year, way more than I have in the past, is probably every two weeks I'll be making a compost extract and spraying the garden with it. And I can't wait to see what that's doing. And thank you, Andy. Andy says it's worth it. Uh, I hope so. I Again, we've sold almost 300 courses now, I think, and we haven't had a single person complain. And I will tell you again, you guys that are taking the course, while you're taking the course, and I put out a video on this that Tom's posted to the site now, but while you're taking the course, right underneath your video, there's a thing that says notes. That's for you. And you can take notes all the way through, attached to every chapter as you're going through and have them just stay there for you. You can go back and take a look at them. So you remember, you can download them as a Word document. Um, and then the other thing that you can do with those notes, if you have a question for me, there's a thing that says notify instructor. You check that box and submit it. 
Uh, I try to answer all of those submissions within 24 hours during the week and 48 hours over weekends. So thank you for the confidence, Andy. I appreciate that. The other thing is aged mulch. So part of my compost course you'll learn in this is if you can get a hold of wood chips and you have a place on your property, you can just let them sit, do that and let them sit. And it, you, when you have another truck come in and dump them, dump them like in order. And when you're drawing from your pile, take the oldest first to cap your compost piles or to make your compost with, because what you're doing is a gigantic version of IMO, indigenous microorganism capture. When you start digging through a, a pile of wood chips that have sat in a field for two years, th what you it's like halfway composted. There's chunks that aren't broken down at all because they were dry spots. There's chunks that were almost completely composted. There's all kinds of critters. There's tons of actinobacteria putting all, all these white strands. There's tons of fungal activity. Every single time we take and cap um, our compost, in the you know, as soon as the thermophilic cycle ends, we get all kinds of different mushrooms flushing out of it. So you know you got fungal activity there. And so, but the other thing is you don't just need to make compost with that, or you, you don't just that's not one thing you can do. Use the oldest wood chips you have when you mulch because you're infusing biology, but you're also providing lignin that's already partially broken down. It's like baby food. Think of it like that. When you use old mulch, you're you're like for all the little little critters that are going to be born that that cycle in your garden, you're giving them baby food. It's easy to digest. It's easy to eat, and that helps build those populations really really well for you. Um, the PVC irrigation again. There's a link to that video in the show notes. Uh, you can go on my channel and just search for irrigation on my channel on YouTube and see how to do it. But the big thing with the irrigation. Is, the, is plumbing in the mechanical timers. When you plug those mechanical timers in, it is so simplistic. During the summer, I need to irrigate almost every day. And on some days, I even irrigate twice a day. And being able to just walk out and go, today I need about 15 minutes of ir uh, irrigation. And just turn it to 15. I turn all four to 15 and walk away. Or if it's like a really hot day, maybe 30 minutes. And then maybe I do 15 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And even though it's not really drip, if you look at what I'm doing, it's more like, soaker irrigation is the way that I've designed it. I will plant my highest value plants right where a hole is. So it's like planting out an emitter, but the way that it soaks the ground, again, it's more a super soaker than a drip irrigator. And it's this nice, even irrigation, keeping those roots cool in the summer. So much less stress on my plants, no matter how much we think I can water manually. We never do it sufficiently, and we always end up with lots of water on the plants, and there's two problems with that. One, as most gardeners know, little water droplets can act like magnifying glasses. So it was late in the afternoon. It was cloudy. We thought it was all good. We water. All the plants get wet, and then right before the sun really goes down, all the clouds burn off, and then it's just blazing and you're getting leaf spot burn and things like that from it. But the other thing is you have all of this biological activity in the detritosphere. And some of it is funguses that don't really cause a problem down there, but you don't want them on your leaves. You don't want them entering the stomata of your plant. So when you water like that, you're stirring all that up by being able to have those lower emitters water. So any kind of automation you're going to do with irrigation I recommend that even if it's some sort of a spray or mist, that it be as low to the ground as possible and still be functional. It is hard to beat what I've done. Now, I've had a lot of people say, well, you got power over there because you got that pond. Why don't you just put them on a programmable timer? Well, I'm a believer that I want to put my eyeballs on my garden daily, and I'm going to do that every morning and turning four knobs is part of that process. That also gives me a chance to walk around when I turn them on and look at all the plate and see if any of my little holes have plugged up on the pipes. And I keep a little piece of aluminum fencing wire on all my arches around my garden. And so there's always a piece there and you just poke a hole and out it comes and you're good to go. It makes you keep an eye on the maintenance of the system. That's my opinion. Um, and when I go away, there's always somebody here to take care of it for me, a house sitter. Uh, next, biologics like Dr. Earth and mycorrhizal fungi 
have been huge in getting this these beds the way that they are. And I would say that the two of them are almost equal in value. And I do other things. You know, I use um, Dirt Doctor, Garrett Juice sometimes to spray, though. Since I've started making this compost, I'm really using that a lot less. It's a great product for you if you don't have another alternative yet. Um, but if you have your own high quality compost, I would just go to doing a compost extract, not a tea, not a tea, an extract. If you have the type of compost I'm talking about, if you take my course, you'll learn the difference uh, in that. But the mycorrhizal fungi, once you know what they do, you're like, I can't not do this. I can't not do this. And again, one pouch of that stuff, I think it's about like 35 bucks or something like that. Whole season. No problem for the average gardener. I might actually have to buy a little bit more this year because of some of the things that I'm doing. But in general, one pouch a season is all you need. And you can probably, after two or three years, stop doing it. By the way, th you guys that are doing things with like winter pea, cow pea, and stuff like that, and you're inoculating it with the rhizomal bacteria for the nitrogen nodules, that too, if you do that for enough seasons, you can at least skip several seasons. Uh, before you need to worry about doing it again. You'll build the population of those bacteria up in your soil so they'll be there to colonize uh, those legumes when they come out. With that, I think we're about ready to answer some questions. Real quick, though, I did mention that the item of the day today was the Vivor Bench. And again, I so recommend that. And one of the coolest things I figured out with it this weekend while I was sitting there on my butt planting stuff so I'm out there for about an hour and a half and it starts to get a little bit warm and I'm a little bit tired and I'm a little bit thirsty. And I go into the shop and I pull the beer out of the, the, the refrigerator. I can't open it. I look in the pouch. I'm like, huh, it holds the beer perfectly too. So check that out. And that was just going to be the only product that I mentioned today. And then I got a price alert for something totally different and not garden related. And I, could not let it go without letting you know because it's the kind of price alerts probably one day, maybe two day at best. The Insta AccuSlim sous vide precision cooker today is on sale for like 75 bucks. It's like a $100 uh, everyday price on it. I like it better than the Anova that I started out with. It's a great sous vide circulator, 75 bucks. It's cheap enough. I might buy an extra one. Uh, I like having two. I really do because you can do two things at a time. Sous vide does so much more than just make great steaks. Totally worth checking out. Um, and I'll tell you what, if you never used it to cook anything, just the fact that when you forgot to take some steaks out, you can throw them in a 65 degree water, turn the circulator on at lowest setting and just move the water around in 30 minutes, your steaks are defrosted. You could season them up and cook them like normal. That alone probably is worth doing, but uh, a lot of cooking they do as well. Again, 75 bucks on sale. You can find it at the survivalpodcast.com or a link you will also be able to find in today's show notes. With that, let's take some questions. And if you have any questions you haven't asked or you don't see them come up, now would be the time. I'll make one second pass. I have about five questions here. Uh, first one comes from Andy, who seems to have quite a bit of questions today. Andy says, how long does the biology in Dr. Earth last? I have a bag from a year and a half that I'm still using. I would use it. Um, most of the bacterial species in there are really great at like basically long-term hibernation. And so are some of the fungi. I would look at Dr. Earth or any product with a living inoculum in it, a lot like we look at drugs. The manufacturer will say use it within two years, but if you use it in four years, it still works, but its efficacy goes down. Dr. Earth's official answer when I signed the deal with them and I said, hey, I'd like to talk to somebody and get some answers on things was one year. That they say that you can bet on high biological activity for one year if stored in a cool, dry place. The hotter and the moister, the more, because once you get moisture in there, a lot of the guys that are asleep wake up. Now, some of the IMO collections that are properly stored using sugar can store for 10 years or more and be just fine. But I don't know that it's that level of hypnosis. I would go ahead and use it, but I would try to buy your, your, your biologics about one year at a time. About one year at a time is what I would shoot for. 
Andy also says, would you have to separate Dino Michael from aspirin in the hole for tomatoes? Absolutely not. You do not have to do that. Um, but what you want to do with your fungal inoculum. So the Dino Michael product is when you look at it, it looks an awful lot like the little balls that are inside a time release capsule. Right. They have a coating on them. And when they get wet, that coating starts to dissolve and those mycorrhizal fungi spores are woken up. They get about 24 to 48 hours on the outside to find a route to infect. And that's the right word for it, by the way. And I know when you say a word like infect, that sets up all kinds of alerts like bad, bad. this is a symbiotic infection. But they need to find a living route to touch and to attach to within 48 hours or they can die. So the other thing is when they kind of wake up, they don't have a lot of mobility. They can start, once they get one attachment, they can start sending out filaments and they can reach much further than bacteria. Bacteria, they look like they're fast when you look at them under a microscope, but they're actually, the distances they're traveling are tiny, right? So again, there's been a little flagella out there. So that, that fungi can reach is they grow their network and they actually intermesh with each other way, way out. But when they first wake up, they need a root. So it's not about separation, but when, again, when I'm inoculating, I don't just throw the mycorrhizal fungi in the hole. I don't mix it in that bucket to throw in there. I want it to touch. And when you have a nice wet root ball and you throw a pinch, it'll stick. And I'll eat, like sometimes I'll even push it into the root ball a little bit and then bury that. So it's not about a separation. It's about ensuring that the minute that mycorrhizal fungi wakes up, it's like, ooh, a root. Because once it's got that connection, the plant, and the, the plant and the fungi now know each other and they can build that symbiosis. And then they can reach out and you can end up, and this is what I'm saying, that guy that asked the question, his friend was right. Yes, if I put a lettuce plant in that I'm going to harvest in 45 days, I don't get that much direct benefit from that one plant on that mycorrhizal fungi. But when I cut that plant and let it come back, how long am I going to grow it for the whole season? Or when I start planting the next, I've got tons of biologics in the soil. So uh, there's the best I can do on that one for Andy. Jackson says, somewhat about gardening, somewhat not. In regards to swales, I always hear make them three foot wide for every one foot deep. Why is this? <sighs> I actually don't even agree with that ratio. I'd say it's about a foot per six foot. But what that that will work. What you don't want with a swale is steep. You don't want to you don't want a trench. You want a shallow ditch. And you want that because if you have swales with really steep sides, your 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 back cut and your front lip, when they fill up, they will erode and and and, and cave in. What you want is something very, you want it wide for the depth. So usually, you know, if you're doing big time projects where we're putting in big trees, you might do something like a three meter that's nine foot by about a foot and a half deep. And what you get is very passive water spread in that situation. And it's not just the water spreading laterally through the swale but the water coming overland into the back of your swale your back cuts architecture is incredibly important and you want that water to be able to slide in not come in like a waterfall if it comes in like a waterfall it'll start eating it and your swale will either grow backwards or what really happens is it looks like it's growing backwards at first it's actually filling in and the thing is sooner or later you'll kind of end up with where you should have started but it's not really very productive to do that. So you're right. It doesn't really hit what we're talking about today, but I'll allow it because it is a ag topic. Uh, Chris says, are moles beneficial? My yard is really compact and like rock hard, but the moles are effectively aerating dirt. I think they are useful enough that I don't mind them. Uh, as long as they're not causing you a problem, as long as they're not causing you a problem, uh, they are not big like a lot of people think they eat your plants. Moles are mostly predators. They like grubs and worms and shit like that. The problem is since they make those tunnels, they don't really give a shit if that tunnel goes straight through your pepper roots, right? So they can damage root systems. They're not that big. Like people think they're being eaten. Like if you have things being eaten, you're looking at like gophers, 
right? Or your your uh, what do you call them? Uh, groundhogs, right? Something like that. Moles, in my experience, have been mostly a predator species. And so as long as they're not causing you major problems in the garden itself, and it's a pretty easy way to keep them out, is to trench around your garden and drop in about a foot deep of hardware cloth. And they're not going to go through that. They're just not going to get through that. Like, you know, just your standard um, mesh. You, you don't want to use like chicken wire or something like that because the holes are small enough or big enough that they can, you know, some moles are pretty small. They can get through there. So like your quarter inch, half inch harbor cloth will work really good for that. And uh, TJP3, have you tried JDAM? Have you heard me talk about it? No, that means I don't do it. Um, it's just not my thing. And it's something I am learning more about, but up till right now, it's just not my thing. Uh, Trapper Z says, are you uh, still a proponent of wood core to help fill new waste blades or should I use more soil? I'm a huge proponent of wood chips for a wood core in your raised beds, especially if your raised beds are two foot deep. If they're a foot deep, you know, maybe two inches, right? Um, you want enough of a true soil level. And my other thing is with raised beds, I don't really like to fill raised beds right to the top. I like to leave a bit of a lip. Uh, including the mulch. And I'll tell you why, when you put out small transplants, that lip of the bed, if they're a little bit below that lip, there's a windscreen. They don't get hit as hard by those spring winds. The other thing is, so now you've got a little bit of a lip and you've got your mulch and you pull your mulch back and you drop your transplant in. Don't push all the mulch back. Leave a little crater there. Now you've got the lip of the bed and you've got the lip of the mulch giving it a little bit of you know, lateral wind protection uh, would be that. But I definitely love doing wood cores. And again, for raised beds, my preference, like I'm not like some kind of asshole about it, but my preference would be use wood chips because I have them. If you want to lay sticks and logs and stuff in there, that's fine too. That's actually cool because you'll get more soil infiltration down to the native soil layer. So that works as well. But to me, wood chips or bushy chopped up carbon and then saturate it with uh, compost tea slash liquid seaweed. And that'll give you a great microorganism uh, core, but it will also mineralize. You'll take all those wonderful trace minerals. There's something like 68 trace minerals in kelp and it'll, the, you know, take, the, put the wood in and let it dry up a bit if it's wet and then slowly soak it. It might even take a couple of days before you start covering it so that it has time to absorb all those minerals into that pulpy wood. And that's why I like wood chips. Wood chips are great at absorbing that. And even when they dry back out, those minerals now are in the little pores. And I would say, now that I understand biochar, like a thin layer of biochar mixed in those wood chips would even do that more. Would even do that more. And you don't need a lot down there. I'm talking like a dusting. So you get your wood chips down and then like a thin coating, like you, you can still see the wood chips. That just is so much more little apartments and things. And as those wood chips break down, the, the biochar becomes again analogous to a coral reef in the soil where life attaches and then grows off of it. So uh, hopefully that answers your questions. I don't see any more questions. So I think uh, and okay, Andy's asking, even though you didn't have the question where there, the aspirin doesn't affect the fungi. No, no, it doesn't have any real detrimental effect on soil fungi at all. Again, we still don't really understand the protection mechanism that's being afforded when it comes to blight, but blight is a fungi, but aspirin are not an antifungal. They're not killing the blight. If they killed the blight, you could just throw down a bunch of aspirin and then plant, and then it would be the whole season, right? Like the protection wanes. It's something about the interaction between the tomato and some component of the aspirin. Again, they think it's the acid, but it may not be. They don't really know. 
And there is some negative stuff around it. It doesn't make a difference. Well, if you live in a place where you don't have tomato blight as a problem, you probably won't notice a difference. And then people always want to make things one size fits all. So what they end up doing is, okay, now I'm going to put aspirin in my peppers. I'm going to put aspirin with my Swiss chard, whatever. There's no difference. Well, no one said there would be. No one said that you, do, do, do the Swiss chard get tomato blight? Does it get early blight and late blight? Do peppers get early blight and late blight? No, then it doesn't do that. So we don't really know what it does, but it's not an antifungal. Bonnie Blue, 2A, with a 999 super chat here at the end. Thank you so much for that. Um, One Million Pumpkin says he read somewhere aspirin affects the tomato's immune system. Yeah, maybe. Does it? I don't know. I don't. You know, again, I read a lot of things somewhere until I can corroborate multiple sources, true studies. I mean, I read a pretty in-depth study by Texas A&M University. I believe that's where the study was done. It could have been, it could have been Texas Tech, but A and M seems like what it was. It's definitely a Texas university. And the conclusion was this absolutely is a single variable works. What does it do? Here's 10 ideas of what it might be doing. We don't know. Right. So those are people when you get down to that level of biochemistry, they know more than I do. And I will just let it be that again. Bonnie, thank you for the super chat. If one person does that an episode, it's really easy to just keep the ads turned off for live streams because Google lies and they say it'll be one every 30 minutes and then they pound you with a bunch of them and I'm not having it anymore. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed today's show. Tomorrow will be something altogether different. Then we'll have a Wednesday interview Thursday, expert counsel, Friday, flashback, and we will continue on. Take care, guys, and have a great week.